So see, Steve, for those, raise your hand if you were here last year. Yeah, we had a little debate that I still maintain I won. You totally won. I totally won. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Raise your hand if Earl Hirsch won the debate last year. Okay, we're done. <laughs> okay, so for my next impersonation, actually, this first slide is Steve, Steve Edelman's uh, blood sugars, his CGM. And... Um, so this has been a really interesting session already for me today, because usually I come to one of the TCOYDs, and I've been to many of them over the years, and I hear these sounds in the audience, which are, they used to be glucose meter sounds, and then over the years they were Medtronic sounds, and today all I've been hearing are the alarms from Dexcom. So. Raise your hand if you're using a Dexcom CGM. Raise your hand. Are you or your partner? Wow. Raise your hand if you're using Medtronic. Yay. A few of you. You are in the minority. Raise your hand if you're using Abbott. One, two, three, four, okay. Raise your hand if you're using Eversense. One on Eversense, okay. You're looking at it. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. So this is a very sophisticated audience, which means by definition, it's more, you're more sophisticated than when I talk to doctors, which is true. Um, raise your hand if you were doing glucose testing in the 1950s. Anybody in the room? 1980s. Many of you. That's right. And all of you, in the, this is really, in front of our eyes, this has been revolutionized so quickly, especially if you consider we are now getting ready for the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. So this is all happening very, very fast. So most of you are very sophisticated with CGM. What are the key things to think about here in August of 2018? Well, obviously in this room, this should be standard of care for type 1 diabetes. In fact, there shouldn't be anybody, at least in this country, in my opinion, that should not have this technology. Now, having said that, I can tell you that is not the case. I don't know what the actual number is, but Dr. Schatz and I are in this big, giant um, uh, registry called the T1D Exchange. You heard about it last night from David Panzer. The actual number of people, even in the exchange, in these diabetes clinics, it's actually relatively small. It's only about, when we look at all ages, all people, it's only about a third. In my clinic as a whole at the University of Washington, not my personal clinic, for our type ones, we're now at 50%. And what really drove it up was about three or four years ago, the big payers in Washington State started covering it, and then about a year and a half ago, thanks to Ann Peters and several others, Medicare covering big, big issues. My practice, it's 80%, and that's too low. I think it should be everybody. It works, the technology that worked best for you last year may have been replaced with different technology now, which may be better. So this is a moving target, and we've certainly seen that in the last five to 10 years. Accuracies have improved, and the entire experience is better than it was a few years ago. Raise your hand if you agree with that bullet point. I mean, I do. I mean, it certainly is a lot better. Insurance does a much, much better job in coverage. In fact, um, not only does Medicare pay for it, but in many states, including where I live earlier this year, Washington State Medicaid started covering the Dexcom and, um, and also the Libre. So we're, we're very happy that more people have access. And this has become an extremely competitive industry. And your business is wanted. And all you have to do is go into the, uh, the fair and you, you saw all the companies. And, and, and that's a good thing. So if you don't know about Libre, let me tell you just a little bit about it. It's a sensor that's worn for 10 days. Wait a minute. Not anymore. It's 14 days. They just got an FDA change. It's two weeks, like it is in Europe. It's a 12-hour warm-up. Wait a minute, it just changed. It's now gonna be a one-hour warm-up. So this is, this is all brand new. This all happened about a couple of weeks ago when it was announced. The insertion, I think everybody would agree, is simple. 
You swipe your reader over the sensor to get a glucose value. You don't need a finger stick. There's no calibration. And what's really interesting now in the UK, and I'm hoping here in the US within the next six months, if not sooner, you won't need to buy this reader. You'll be able to use your smartphone. And the smartphone will have an app on it, and you'll be able to use that app instead of this reader. That's already available in some parts of the world. You have trend arrows that shows you the direction that it's going, but importantly, there's no alarms. I mean, you get an alert if you swipe it and you're above or below target, but it's not gonna wake you up at night. It's not gonna wake up your partner, it's not gonna wake up your dog, okay? It will be silent, whether you're too high or too low. And, and even silly people can wear this. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean it, it, is, it, is, it is there, it is what it is. Okay, so you're all familiar with Dexcom. The, um, raise your hand if you're on G6 already. That's actually pretty good because um, there, it's just getting launched, it's just getting started. Um, raise your hand if you're a Medicare patient wearing Dexcom. Wow. So I just heard at lunch, this will be available hopefully in October for Medicare patients, the Gen 6, which lasts 10 days and it's factory calibrated. You don't have to do any calibration as with the Libre. You, you obviously know about the trend arrows. That's not gonna change the alarms for high or low glucose, which you can set where you want to, and share capabilities. Now here's something that I did not know, and that is you can use the, in the Gen 6, you have this, you have a receiver, or you can use the, your, your phone. Now most of the people like to use their phone, but what I was very surprised at, Ann Peters and I are involved in a study called the Wisdom Study. Is anybody in the, here involved in Wisdom? You're in Wisdom. At, at what site? Um, you're talking about for, uh, for breast cancer, right? No, not with. I didn't know wisdom is a breast cancer study. It's also a study for seniors with a type 1 diabetes using Dexcom. Okay, so, boy, I, it's a, I did not know that. Um, so we have all of these seniors, uh, several hundred of them, and less than 10% of them want to use their phone. They want to use the receiver. And, and I'm, you know, whatever that works, but this is what I just learned. For the Gen 6, the receiver does not have the share capabilities. I think that's wrong, especially as this is being um, uh, rolled out for Medicare patients. And you all know what this looks like. You can use this on your, on your watches. I don't yet have an Apple Watch. Maybe someday I will. We'll see. Now, there are a few of you. Now, for those of you who are using Medtronic, sensors in the audience, raise your hand if you're on the 670G. Okay. Raise your hand if you're using a Medtronic pump and you're not on 670G. Less of you. Okay. So, this sensor as it is right now, um, it lasts for seven days. And I, I should say, the actual labeling, it says up to seven days. Because it doesn't always last seven days. The sensor sends it to the insulin pump or with this new Guardian Connect that's only been out for maybe a month or so, it can go directly to a phone. So it used to be, if you're using a Medtronic sensor, it has to go to your Medtronic pump. No more. They now have a sensor, it's actually the same sensor that goes directly to a phone. You need to calibrate it, which is different from Dexcom and Abbott. Trend arrows, of course, those will stay the same, both for the standalone device with the phone and what you see with the pump in the 670G, and of course, the alarms for high or low. Sensionics ever since, this was just approved. And I don't have any patients on it yet. There's, what, one person in the audience on it? And the, reason, the main reason why I don't have any, and there may be more than one, is that at least where I live, there's no coverage for it yet. There's no reimbursement. And and that's really kind of what drives everything. It has to be covered. And it's very different than things were five years ago because now we have coverage for these others and 
you know, we have to see coverage before we see this uh, being used. In any event, right now in the U.S., it's a 90-day wear. It's a very short insertion of the sensor, but the insertion has to be, it's a little tiny procedure where it's inserted under the skin in the arm. In Europe, they're using 180-day sensors. The goal is to get to one year. So you have the procedure once a year, and you're, you're done. It's, it's accurate. You still need finger sticks for this one, and at least for now, adjunctive labeling, which means you need to, from the FDA's point of view, do a finger stick glucose test to make an insulin adjustment. Smartphone only display. It does not have any problems with Tylenol, which is acetaminophen. And this is the sensor right here. It's very small. And what people, what you do is the transmitter goes on top of it. It fits so you can take the transmitter off. And where I have had patients over the years where I only wish we would have had this is for my athletes. Um, I've taken care of a lot of college athletes, uh, Seattle Mariners, Seattle Seahawks. I mean, these are professional athletes. And um, um, to be able to take off the transmitter during a game or an intense practice and to have that a bit availability would have been great for them because right now, for the majority of these people, they can't wear, you know, they, they can't wear sensors, and that's a problem. For this, that's not an issue. Okay, those are the basics. How do I use this to take care of, to take my diabetes management to the next level? Lots of questions, maybe not questions for everybody. Okay, what does CGM do? It can, this research shows it can lower your A1C if you use it. It can reduce the amount of time your blood sugars are low if you use it. And I think most people would say it improves one's life. At least I would say that. But you have to use the information. One of the biggest disappointments we had as a researcher was when we did the JDRF sensor trial because what we saw, the way you do statistics, is when you come into a trial, whether you take the medicine or use the technology, you're still counted in the trial whether or not you take the medicine or use the technology. And what we showed is that this worked very well in adults, but not in young children or in adolescents and the young adults because they didn't wear it very much. And it's not going to work if you don't wear it. But then when we looked at it for when they did wear it, it actually worked great. So you have to wear it. So I, I think the first thing is looking at basal insulin, if we're talking about type 1 diabetes. And how do we use this technology to figure out basal insulin? Well, the way to look at it at first, whether you're on multiple injections or pumps, is to look at this overnight, waking up every morning and to see if the blood sugar is going up or down. And so this is sort of the goal that we have done in our clinic, is that ideally you'd like to be within 20 points of when you wake up from where you went to bed. And that is called the BEAM score, okay? That's the bedtime glucose minus the morning glucose, the BEAM score. And we have people where I look at the average when they go to bed, I look at the average when they wake up, and the BEAM score is 70. They wake up great, they wake up at 110 as an average, but they're going to bed at 190 as an average. So that's a BEAM score that's very high, and that means there's too much basal insulin. So this can be done, and this is how to set it up. What we tell our patients to do is an early dinner and not a high-fat dinner, obviously, because you don't want, you all know about IOB, insulin on board. You don't want IOB or FOB. What's FOB? Food on board, okay? When you go to bed, you want it, so there's, there's only the basal insulin and there is no food. So what I tell patients is, it doesn't have to be a perfect glucose, but you want to go to bed between 90 and 150 and you want that CGM flat. Goal is to wake up within 20 points of where you went to bed. You want a beam score of 20 or less. So let's test it. John goes to bed with a glucose of 140. His arrow's flat. He takes his usual 25 dose of Lantus, 25 units. The next morning, this is what he sees. 
You see he had this spike before 6 o'clock. He goes to bed at 145, and he wakes up at 89. And at least on this night, assuming he didn't have any correction dose insulin for that 125, he has a beam of 56. His blood sugar went down by 56. That's too much of a drop. Now, I have to tell you, looking at one night is probably not enough. What you really want to do is you want to see a pattern. But if that blood sugar is dropping by 50 to 60 every night, that's too much. But you know what? That is a, that is a um, I would say that's more of a rule than an, than an exception because people really like to overdo the basal insulin. And the reason why we see so much basal insulin is because it helps with the spikes. If you have all this insulin on board, you're not spiking as much. But by the same time, the negative part about that is that you're prone to more hypoglycemia, especially if there's too much basal insulin overnight. Now, what's the one time, what's the one time for half of patients we intentionally use too much basal insulin? What's that? When you're sick? Nope. Dawn phenomenon? Nope. Half of patients. That's everybody eats pizza. What's that? High fat diet? Nope. Pregnancy. The man in the orange and red got it. It's true. And, and, and the reason why we do that, and we do that intentionally, is because we've known since the 1980s from a very good friend of uh, Dr. Schatz and myself, Dr. Jovanovic. She was the one who showed that these spikes during pregnancy are so bad for the baby. And the way we can keep the spikes away is we have all of our tricks, we have our new insulins, we can wait longer between giving the insulin and eating, but if we have too much basal insulin, we're not gonna have as much of a spike but now we're prone to having more hypos and we have to snack more during the day. In Seattle, our babies who come in with these ladies who have these high basal insulins and they're snacking during the day and maybe they have a few more lows, but we have these gorgeous babies when they're born. You know what we call those babies in Seattle? Nordstrom babies. <laughs> Seriously, that's what we call them. That's the one time. But this is, here's the interesting part about this. I don't want to go on this too much, but here's the interesting part about this. We have taught everybody, going back to when I was a medical student, 50% basal, 50% meal. That's too much basal. And what we've learned from all of you on the hybrid closed loop, and what we've learned from these new basal insulins you heard about this morning, Tujeo and Traceba, is 50% is too much basal insulin. And the real basal insulin is closer to 40, at the very most 45. And we, I look at this now. I look at, I look at this in everybody um, in terms of how much basal insulin. Because if somebody comes in on 63% basal insulin, I know we have a problem. And even 50%, it's probably not right. But in this case, the blood sugar dropped. And if this is the pattern, we, we go ahead and we, we start trial and airing, and we start going down on the lanthus. If he was on a pump, we would start decreasing the basal at least overnight, because I know that these blood sugars typically drop overnight, and we also know this is when people are more prone to having their bad hypos, and the reason is several fold. Number one, you're not eating, you're not alert, you're not awake, obviously, and as it turns out, whether you have diabetes or not, you don't need as much insulin for your basal insulin needs. And so this is a real important point. So after three to four tries, looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Let's do the next one. Her name is Linda. She's a super, super cool type one. She went on a pump. Her doc put her basal rate at 0.5 units around the clock, and she can't figure out if her basal rate overnight is right. And she noticed this happening. She says, my sugar was fine when I went to bed, but look what happened. And this is happening every night. So it's really obvious to see she needs more basal insulin. And as a matter of fact, it may be throughout the day, and, and that has to be tested. What about Susie? This happened for several nights, and she saw the same pattern. She increased her basal from 0.5 to 0.55, and then finally to 0.6. And 
You know, she kept increasing it and increasing it. And the point is, whether you're on injections, especially with the new basal insulins, um, or you are on a pump, this is possible. This is possible for most people. I have to tell you, you saw some curves this morning on Lantus. And when we first got Lantus, compared to what we were using before with Ultra Lente and NPH, we were ecstatic. It, it, was, it was one of the things that we knew the studies that were published, yet this rarely happens. Usually the clinical trials are better than our personal experience. When Lantus came out in 2001, our personal experience was better than the studies. It was, it was so good because people weren't crashing overnight, and usually the crashes were they'd either wake up or they'd have seizures or it was, it was really ugly. And, and I think one of the things that's happened is we've gotten spoiled because we are, the, the, Lantus, the Lantus is so much better than what we were using before with the NPH because the Ultra Lente was taken off the market. I was actually one of the people that liked Ultra Lente because I disliked NPH so much. But, but what happened was we got CGM. And we knew that there were problems with Lantus, but we didn't really see them until we saw the CGM. And one of the first things we saw with Lantus, raise your hand if you're on Lantus or Basilar. There's not many of you. Raise your hand if you're on Traceba. A few of you. Raise your hand if you're on Tujeo. A few of you. Okay. You're about a third, a third, a third. But what we learned with Lantus, once we started doing the CGM, and if you look at the kinetics of Lantus, it makes total sense. It works better in type 1 diabetes if you use it twice a day. But the other thing about using it twice a day is you have to take it at the same time. You don't want to be more than an hour off because the insulin doesn't last 24 hours. If you take it twice a day, you actually get 24-hour coverage, but the absorption isn't as consistent as Tujeo and Traceba but we could see it, we could see it with the CGM. And so now, this, is, this, you know, this slide that you see here now, whether you're wearing a pump or you're on injections, everybody should be able to have that. I have that, everybody should have that. It's not that hard. And that, that to me should be the goal. Okay, this is Bruce. He's trying to figure out if his, trace his traceba dose, but he's usually needing to correct high blood sugars at bedtime. He's now taking 15 units of traceba in the morning, and you can take traceba at any time. Um, he takes it in the morning. He takes Novolog with his meals. He uses one unit for every 40 points above 130 to correct his highs. He's wearing a new Medtronic Guardian Connect CGM, and this is what it looks like. And here he is on day one. This is midnight. This is 4 a.m. This is 5 a.m. And what he did right here with his blood sugar at 220 is he took two units of Novolog. And you can see what happens. He got low. And the question is, is this the Traceba or is it the Novolog? Why did he get low? What do you think? Raise your hand if you think it's Novolog is the problem. Raise your hand if you think Traceba is the problem. Raise your hand if you think both are the problem. Ah, ah. You know what, my, when I look at this, you know what I say? I have no idea. <laughs> I can't tell. It could be one, it could be the other, but it's really interesting because here's the next night on day two and the blood sugar looks like it's trending down. And so right here, he had a 25 grams of carb. Blood sugar came up, and it stayed pretty consistent through the rest of the day. So to me, I think it probably was mostly the Novolog from that first night, because he looks, he looks pretty stable here. But you really have to look at multiple nights to know for sure. But the nice thing is, with the CGM, you can figure it out. The key thing is, when you're going to bed, it's really hard to figure it out if you're always having to give correction dose insulin, or this time of year, especially in Seattle, everybody's eating their dinner at 9 o'clock at night. Can't figure it out when you eat such a late dinner. So here are the pearls, the things to remember. 
What we've learned from CGM and better basal insulins and the hybrid closed loop in adults, most patients, if they're on an isocaloric diet, that means they're not trying to lose weight or gain weight, they're on the same amount of calories to keep their weight stable, they only need about 40% of their total insulin is basal insulin. And it doesn't matter if you're getting your insulin in a pump or with injections. The variability with insulin absorption in pumps can be profound. I mean, we didn't know until a few years ago that the absorption on day one of a pump is very different than the absorption of day three. Raise your hand if you wear a pump again. Keep your hand up if you wear it for more than three days. Keep your hand up if you wear it for five days. Raise your, keep your hand up if you wear it for six days. The pump. If you're, if you're wearing your pump, your infusion set, I'm sorry, your infusion set. Raise your hand if you wear it for four days or more. Raise your hand if it's five days. Raise your hand if it's six days for your infusion set. Because here's the deal. There's still one up. Your absorption is different on day two compared to day one, and it's even more different on day six. It's faster. It's faster. You would think it would be slower. It's actually faster. Why, why are your results? I, I don't know, but, but these studies have been done. There was a company, we were doing studies with them, located here in San Diego called Halozyme. And what they figured out was their insulin actually got slower over time. And as it turned out, um, when they looked at the data from their control group not using their insulin, the other insulins got faster over time. So they closed down their insulin program because the longer you wear it, the faster it goes. Now, there are other reasons not to wear it more than three days. And the biggest reason I see in my patients by far is people over the years run out of real estate. It's a, raise your hand if you used to be on a pump, but now you're off because you ran out of real estate. Not a lot. Not, you're close. Yeah. Well, here's the good thing if you're close. We have really good basal insulins now. And you won't lose anything as long as you wear a CGM. That's the good news. But you have to give shots before meals. Or in Jeremy's case, you have to inhale your insulin. Okay, so those with severe early morning insulin resistance, we also call the dawn phenomenon, they need to appreciate the severity of the insulin resistance is not consistent from day to day. A friend of mine in Albuquerque, New Mexico, he did some recent studies on this. We've known about this from the 1980s called the dawn phenomenon, where the, you know, we, we set the pumps to give more insulin in the morning. But here's the thing, from day to day, that amount of insulin resistance can be extremely different. And so it's really hard to get it right when it changes so much from day to day, whether you're on a pump or you are on injections. So it's about timing, and especially with the basal insulin. And this is really important because there were studies that were done relatively recently, I would say within the last two to three years. But it makes sense when you look at how slow Novolog and Humalog are absorbed, that when you make a change in your basal dose, it takes two to four hours before you see a change in the actual blood sugar. Two to four hours. So at a minimum, if you want less insulin at midnight, you have to turn the pump down at 10 p.m. Did you know that? That's, that's real important. Now, I, we don't know about FIASP. Nobody has done these studies. The FIASP is just a little bit shorter, but there are other insulins in development that will be even much faster. And so the way we think about pumps and the timing will change. For patients on multiple injections, obvious superiority with our two newer basal insulins. So, summary on basal before we get to mealtime. The job of basal insulin is to keep the blood sugar flat when you're not eating. Test your basal multiple times. Only if you notice a pattern make a change because every day can be different. Does your basal need to be changed all night? part of the night or only certain times of the month. We haven't talked about this, but uh, women who are cycling every month um, with their menstrual uh, cycles, their insulin requirements can be very different in about a third of women. <coughs> Excuse
excuse me, less is more. Okay, what about when you eat? Up and down. You all saw this slide from earlier. Here's Homer. When you eat, you can see the shark attack. It does look a little bit like a shark. But there have been many studies looking at this, looking at the timing. And this was a study looking at eating the same meal, taking the same dose of mealtime insulin. And this bottom one here with the, uh, the diamonds, this is what happens when you give your insulin 20 minutes before a test meal. These triangles up here is when you give your insulin I'm sorry, this is when you give your insulin at the start of a meal, and it's no different if you give your insulin after the meal. The point is, we spend so much time looking at the dosing of the mealtime insulin, and the reality is, the timing is so important. In fact, I would even say more important. It is so important, and, and in fact, when we did the JDRF sensor trial back in, gosh, we. We, uh, we presented it October 2nd, 2008, a decade ago. So we did this trial in um, 2007. I remember that date. I remember that date very well because uh, we presented it in Rome at the EASD meeting. And um, it was right before the election, and we were in all these interesting discussions, and almost we almost got put in jail because we had two people in our group who didn't agree politically. That's a whole other interesting story. But it, it, was, it was quite an interesting trial because we then went back and on the adult side, since we had the largest number of adults at the University of Washington, we asked the question, what did you do to make your blood sugars come down? And they, we got the same answer over and over. What we've been telling them for years, they gave their insulin time to work before eating. That was the number one thing they did. And their A1Cs, they actually started pretty well. They went from, they went from 7.6 to 7.1, okay? It came down a half a point. But it was just from, um, the main thing was, was the timing of their meal. Now this comes from Stephen Ponder, and it, it just shows you about these bending of the meal times. So for example, if the blood sugar's going up, you wanna wait longer to bring the blood sugar down. If the blood sugar is stable, we usually say minimum of 10 to 15 minutes. If the blood sugar is coming down, you don't want to, you actually want to reduce that amount of time that you wait before eating because, because um, the insulin just doesn't need as much time. Now what's really interesting is we're having more and more patients taking this FIASP and the rules that we've been using over the years are changing. Raise your hand if you take FIASP. Is there anybody? Two, I, two people, uh, th two in the room take FIASP. I have a feeling if I ask that question next year, it'll be more of you. Actually, actually, what you need to know, is there anybody in the room on Basilgar? Have you heard of Basilgar? You've heard of it. So Basilgar is the biosimilar GLAR gene, very similar to Lantus. It's technically not a generic. It is called a follow-on or a biosimilar. Well, the first biosimilar Lyspro, or Humalog, came out earlier this year. Now, it's actually in the pharmacies. Nobody knows about it. But I have a feeling that many of you, if not most of you, next year, when we all change formularies again on January 1st, you'll, be, you'll have financial incentives to use the biosimilar Lyspro. And I don't think you'll see any difference, but what that really means is that for those of you who want to try FIAS, but may be more expensive. Okay, so use your CGM to learn how your body responds to food and insulin. So what do you do? You see this if you're just doing finger sticks, and you're gonna react differently if you see this, and you're gonna react differently if you see that. Everyone, re I think everybody understands why these arrows are so important. Here you would take a larger dose than usual and use a longer lag time. And here, um, you, may, you may not even, you may just wait and see what happens where it comes. But the point is, I think you in this group probably understand these arrows very well. I, unfortunately, I don't think most physicians, because they never see it. 
you guys are watching this all day. The doctors, they may, look, they may or may not look at the download, but they never see the arrows. And so this is something we have to, I think we have to teach the doctors. And just out of curiosity, raise your hand if when you go to see your doctor, every time you go, you get your technology downloaded. That's pretty good. Raise your hand if you don't every time you go. A few of you, not many of you. Not many, because they don't even ask? Because in my very humble opinion, they need to help you. They need to, they need to look at your, your information. It's, uh, I think it's very important. So as important as dosing with CGM, the timing of this lag time is also important. So when the blood sugar is going up, you need to give more time. And when the blood sugar is going down, it's OK to give less time. And we actually came up with some rules. So if you're using Novolog or Humalog and there's no arrow, it's flat, we usually want to wait somewhere between 5 and 15 minutes. If you're on a Dexcom and you have this 45 degree arrow, what we do is, we, we, one of the things we do is we teach patients to increase, to add 25 to 50 points to whatever their blood sugar is and correct based on that blood sugar but then you want to increase the lag time also. So you really have two things you're doing. You are increasing the dose of insulin, you're giving more correction dose, and you're increasing the timing. If you have an arrow straight up, you're gonna add at least 50 points to the blood sugar. You're gonna increase the lag time even more. And in this situation where you have two arrows up, you're gonna even add more to the blood sugar, 75 to 100. And you know, if you're really having two arrows up, we generally want to wait 20 to 30 minutes. Really important. So there's two things. And when it's going down, it's, it's the opposite. Um, we use no lag time if the adjusted value is below 100, because now we're going to be subtracting. So if you have this arrow coming down and you're going to subtract 25 to 50, if that gives you an adjusted value under 100, just give your injection and eat. Same thing here, if it's going straight down, you're gonna subtract more, and if it's going with two arrows down, you're gonna subtract even more. Because you have this information, and you have two things you can change, the dose of the insulin and the timing of the insulin. And this is the most, to me, this is much more complicated than the basal insulin. Many, many people don't understand this. So. First one is Donald. He's about to eat a 50 gram meal. His carb ratio is one to 10. He looks at his Freestyle Libre, and this is what he sees. Okay? So, what insulin dose and what lag time? What do you, what do you think? He's about to have a 50 gram meal. It's Donald. What do you want to do? No lag. no lag time. What do you want to do with his dose? Arrow down, you calculate it, he's at 60. The dose should be five, but most people would give four. So you're, you got that right. The lag time with a blood sugar of 60, you, can, you could even give the insulin right after eating with that adjusted at 60. Does that all make sense? Okay, let's do the next one. Donald Jr., he's about to eat a 50 gram meal. Same carb ratio. He looks at his Apple Watch, and this is what he sees on his Apple Watch. Okay, so what insulin dose and what lag time? What do you want to do here? Six units. Six units. Okay, so what's his, what's his corrected glucose? Well, let me show you. With an arrow going up, we had 25. It's 108. His dose is five units. You wait five to 15 minutes. You act like he has a blood sugar of 108. Okay, that was. But this is this is how to think about it. This is how you want to think about it. And 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 the problem is, I don't know, um, Steve. Do, do you, does TCOYD have a good reference for patients on how to do this? I mean, it's it's in your book, right? Ah, okay. What about the alarms? So, you know, the alarms are important too. They're real important. So where to set the alarms? And, and you know, 
you want to set it where you're going to do something with it. And on the high side, you want to set it where you're going to take insulin. That's why people come in with an alarm at 160. Why would you do that? You're not going to take insulin all the time at 160. And by the same token, why would you do it at 300? Don't you want to know before you hit 300? I do. Um, we generally want the low alarms at 70, but we do have exceptions to that. People who don't feel their lows, we may put it at 80. And we often tighten these alarms over time. But the repeat alarms, now, what are, the, what are repeat alarms? Do all of you know about these repeat alarms? When the alarm goes off, and then it can go off again. And of course, the problem with the repeat alarms is that people go crazy with them because if they have the high repeat alarm at 15 minutes or 30 minutes and the blood sugar is 300, it can take hours and hours to come, and now what you have is a mad spouse. Okay, because you're up all night. And so with the high alarms, you want it high enough that you'll give insulin, but repeat not so often that it wakes you or you stop paying attention or your wife decides to leave. Okay, so what I do on the high alarms, I, I just say every three hours for most of the time. And again, there's always exceptions. But three hours is, is plenty for the high alarm. Now the low alarms are different. The low alarms for safety, I'll have them repeat every 15 minutes. As a, as a general rule of thumb. Where to wear it? Anywhere you want. Now, this is not the labeling from the, uh, from the companies. There actually is, I, I recommend this a lot. We get, you can get this on Amazon, um, this wonderful tape that you can put on over the, uh, the transmitters. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of sensor you use, and they have some really cool things here for the kids. So, the future of CGM, they're smaller, less or no calibration, we're moving towards artificial pancreas, we're now, we actually, we're not waiting for, we actually have implantable. I wanna thank you all very much, and um, I know we have our next one, and um, if we can turn off the, the if we can t t turn off the video, I actually have a picture last night of Steve after his picture party. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. Hey, hey, everybody. Um, thanks, Earl, for, you know, I, when Earl gives lectures around the world, which he commonly does, people will text me. They said, Earl's getting you. And uh, I'm not even at the meeting. Um, we have the video camera set up out there. And we, what I said earlier at the break, we want to get people's thoughts, 15 seconds, something like that, of what would uh, three hours a day improve time and range mean to you. And uh, we're trying to make a video montage. We'll put it on our website and make it available to anybody. So if, if you can do that for us, we want to get more people. I never, I didn't make the announcement until today, just before lunch. So we got 15 minutes before the next uh, set of workshops. One more, one more okay, Earl, come I on back. Real quick, my favorite Steve Edelman story. I'm in Israel, in Jerusalem, with my wife. And it's my last night there. We're in an elevator going to a mall in Jerusalem. And there's somebody in the elevator, and he looks at me, and he says, I know you. I know you. You're, you're an endocrinologist. You're an endocrinologist. And I go, yeah. He goes, and you live on the west coast of the U.S. And I go, yeah. He goes, Steve Edelman, it's so good to see you. <laughs> True story. <laughs>